started out with one family that had multiple family members that had pulmonary hypertension and identified the first mutation in KCNK3 or TASC1. We then started going to uh, actually an international group of collaborators. Um, again, for a rare disease, we wanted to put together the strength of the entire community internationally behind this. So we worked with collaborators both in the United States as well as in Europe uh, and put together all of our families with familial pulmonary hypertension and screened them all for mutations, again, in the same gene. Because based on finding this in one family, we couldn't be sure that we had the right gene. We wanted to be sure that we could see this in other families and essentially independently replicate this information. So as we did that, we found that it's certainly not a common cause of pulmonary hypertension, but we found three families that have different mutations in the gene, as well as we went back again to those idiopathic cases. Again, cases that didn't clearly have a family history, and we again found not a very high percentage, but we did find three more idiopathic cases of pulmonary hypertension that again had three different mutations for a total of six mutations within that gene. Going beyond that, we needed to be able to functionally assess whether or not this was having an impact. So the genetic information is powerful, but ultimately there are some reasons why the genetics are not good enough alone for us to truly believe all of this. So we went back and we actually functionally tested these channels. So we, we tested, we put them in sort of normal channels as well as channels with the mutation, put them into frog eggs basically, and actually used a technology that we call hatch clamping to look at the conductance of potassium going through those channels to see if those channels in the normal, uh, uh, the normal copy of that version of the gene, whether they function normally, and in fact they do, and then in individually, one by one, putting in each of the six mutations that we'd identified in individuals with pulmonary hypertension and to see how those channels worked in those patients. In fact, in every single one of those six mutations, all of them were inactive. None of those channels actually worked to conduct the potassium through those channels. So in addition to having the genetic dimension to prove that that was in fact the right cause of the pulmonary hypertension, we now had functional data to show that that was functionally in fact an inactive version of the channel.